You may be seated. We uh, <clears throat> lately have been thinking about Christmas for Christ. Don't forget that's coming up, I believe, on February 6th. Is that what I said? I think it was. Sunday night should be. So don't forget that Christmas for Christ will be coming around the corner before we know it. Did I say 16th? I say 6th. 16th. Thank you. All right. 16th then. That'll give you a little bit more time, won't it? Welcome, everybody. Is everybody alive this morning? I want to welcome all of our guests. It's good to have uh, Brother Frankie with us this morning and his son, Tyler. Frank became a part of this church many years ago and then moved off to the Wild West and is back again. I'm happy to see him and his son. All of uh, our first-time guests, we're very happy to have you. Um, I know I've got a first-time guest in here somewhere, but she may be out with a baby. And we're very happy to have her. And is it Nick? Nick, it was good to have you. Where, where's Nick at? Okay, good to have Nick with us this morning up on the balcony. <clears throat> Praise God. The Lord is so gracious and kind to us. Tonight we're going to have a great time. Don't forget to be here. It's going to be awesome. It's good to see Sister Pat here. She's been battling with sickness all winter and... She made it out. And I don't know, I'm probably missing somebody, but we're happy that you've come. It's good to see you in the house of God. Hallelujah. I noticed some of you making a start right before I left, and you're still here holding on, and that's great. Folks, winter will come to an end. Spring is coming. Hold the fort. Keep the fires burning. Hallelujah. There's so many things that are going on in our world right now that lets us know that we're facing the end time. Um, just before I left, I preached on, as it were, in the days of Lot. And I remember telling you that we would see increased angelic activity because in the days of Lot, angels came and ministered to Lot and warned Lot. And I just shared this with the school. I want to share it with you too. I'd taken a book with me to Florida to read called The Coal Miner Preacher. And <clears throat> I had not only read a few pages of it. So I got down there and I was reading through the book, and as I got to the middle of the book, the writer said, you can expect uh, increased angelic activity in the last days because it will be, as it were, in the days of Lot. And I'm telling you, folks, my hair is about stood right up on the back of my head. I said, God, this is not just a coincidence, but, you know, you showed that to me before I left, and now here we are sitting here reading this book, and it was almost word for word. I want you to know that I feel like God is ready to do some extraordinary things among us, and that because we are living in the last days, that we can expect God to get more involved in, in, by way of sending angels. Hallelujah. So I've been kind of walking around, looking out of the corner of my eye, thinking I might be entertaining an angel unawares. And uh, I even think maybe it might have happened. And I was too numb to go over and strike up a conversation. But this guy just kept staring at me and staring at me and staring at me. And it wasn't an unfriendly person. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. The point is, is that God is ready to do great and mighty things. We're going to go to the Word in just a moment. Before we do, we're going to just pray again. 
Sister Suzanne was telling me that Brother Sherbet Bumps is uh, very sick. So we want to pray that God would touch him and uh, that God would heal him. Praise God. Lord Jesus, you're the great and mighty God. There's nothing you cannot do. Father, ask you to touch Brother Bumps, heal his body. Today, right now, God, heal him completely. And I thank you for it, God, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord God, we thank you for your hand of mercy upon all of us. Hallelujah. Thank you for your protecting hand. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. How many came today with an expectancy in your heart that God is going to do something great? Oh, I just feel like this is going to be an awesome day. I got to tell you that I'm having trouble getting my, there we go. I got to tell you, that wasn't what I was going to tell you. I went over to the hospital, and there's something about that new hospital being right next door to us. And I went over, and there was an old man there by the name of Merrill Vincent, Brother Ricky Vincent's dad. He's 93. When I walked in his room, he was just as sharp and knowledgeable Talked with him for a moment, had to talk loudly. And I said, Brother Merrill, have you been baptized in Jesus' name? We talked about it, and he said, his grandson Ricky was there when he got baptized. I said, well, you were baptized, right? I said, Brother Merrill, have you received the Holy Ghost? He said, I've never spoken tongues. I looked around, thought, well, deja vu. Closed the door, went back over to him and said, Brother Merrill, God is going to fill you with the Holy Ghost right now. Begin to pray in his mouth, begin to speak. I couldn't hear because he's very old and weak, but he was staring at me and his mouth was moving. I said, Brother Merrill, you're receiving the Holy Ghost. I said, all day today, when there's nobody around, I want you just to go ahead and speak that right out loud. And he just stared at me and just kept. It's amazing what God is doing. God is ready to do great and mighty things. Your situation is not impossible. Your situation is not out of control. The devil would like for you to think it's out of control, but it's not. With God, all things are hallelujah. And today, I want everything God ever gave me, I want it back. See, the devil's a thief. The Bible identifies him as a thief. He comes to steal. And he loves to steal away from us our experience our spiritual things. Come on now. You could be sitting in the building and your soul can be a million miles away right now. You can be sitting here right now in this building and just be as dead as dead can be. But you know what? God wants to give you back everything that God ever gave you. He wants you to have it back until you are completely restored where you want to be with the Lord. So with that in mind, I'm going to the Word of God now and I thank you for indulging me for a few moments. And I won't be long this morning. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. Brother Roach, did you get my choir fixed? Okay. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. I'm just going to preach this morning, teach on this 
little subject for anyone who cares. I want to preach on this subject. Take me back. Take me back. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy to us. Thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing among us and how you are doing great and mighty things. And I thank you for sending your angels this morning to talk to us, to help us, to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. Father, I ask right now that the hand of God be mighty in this place. I ask, O oh Lord, that every spirit that would try to distract, Lord, every spirit that would try to deaden, every spirit that would try to hinder, I pray in the name of Jesus, those spirits would be bound. And in the name of Jesus, let the presence of the Lord fill this house completely, every nook and cranny. Lord, every cubic inch of this place be filled with your presence. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, come into our hearts today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now we know that the mystery of the seven stars and the seven candlesticks is explained in the same chapter in verse 20. And there the Bible tells us that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and that the seven candlesticks are representative of the seven churches. Stars is uh, unto the seven stars of the church which he holds in his right hand, he said, those stars are from the Greek word angelos, which simply means a messenger. Many of you know it also means pastor. So notice that verse 2 tells us that the pastor, the ministry, is held in God's mighty right hand, for which I say thank you, Jesus. You know, I've noticed over the years that God doesn't call a person without giving that person the authority and the, and the power, protection, influence, whatever, needed to do the job. And let me just say this, make a little parenthesis here this morning. In a day in which nothing is held sacred, in a culture in which nothing is held sacred, when even the word holy is when it's used, oftentimes is disrespected and connected to vulgarity. Don't be one of those. In a culture where authority is continually challenged and questioned, I want to compliment you for showing respect to the house of God, to the ministry whom God holds in his right hand. I think that's forever important as we approach the coming of the Lord. For the scriptures declare not once but twice. It says in 1 Chronicles 16 and also in Psalm 105, the very same words, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. The Lord told the Ephesian church, he said, I know thy works and I know thy labor. And, and, and that's not a bad thing, you know, when, when God says, I know your works and I know your labor. Perhaps our first instinct is, ooh, I haven't done all that I could do. But it really is a positive thing. What he's saying is, is that he notices and notes everything that's done for him. Not one labor goes unnoticed. Not one glass of water given goes unrewarded. But he says, I know and I notice your labor. Everything that you do, when you try to help your fellow man, when you try to do someone a good turn in the name of Jesus, when you go to the hospital and visit someone who's sick and you do it in the name of Jesus, so, or you go to the prison and you visit someone that's incarcerated and you do it in the name of Jesus, every one of these things that you do, God notices and takes note of, and he says, I have noticed your labor and I have noticed what you've done. As we race toward the coming of the Lord, the catching away of the church, 
It is so very important that we do not grow weary in well-doing. I think everyone needs to understand, and we do understand it, but I think we need to realize it was prophesied that in the last days that people would be going at an incredible rate of speed. It's not like it used to be where you had lots of leisure time and you sent things by snail mail. Now it's email. And now it's the drive through unfortunately, restaurant. And it's the drive through bank and we're on the run, and the Bible says that in the last days, knowledge would be increased and that men would run. And so, here we are. But as we race toward the catching away of the church, what we call the rapture, we must not grow weary. We must not allow ourselves to faint. God has chosen us for this hour. You were not born indiscriminately or randomly, but I know from reading the Word of God that every one of us had a particular time that God chose for us to be born, and every one of us, whether you realize it or not, have a particular time that God has chosen for us to depart from this world. No birth or death ever catches God by surprise. And precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. Because when a saved person dies, it's not a failure, it's not a disappointment, it is to us, but to those who are saved and who are caught to be with, are, are brought to be with the Lord, it's a day of rejoicing. It's a day of excitement. It's a day of everything they've lived for culminates. And I think sometimes the devil would love for us to forget that there is an eternity and, and try to make us feel like this is all there is. There's nothing more than this. It'll never get any better than this. Whatever good things are going to happen to me must happen now. No, that's not true. This is just, as you all know, the dressing room for eternity. This is just the locker room before the game. There really is a place called heaven. There really is a place called hell. There really is an eternity that goes forever and ever and ever and ever and never ends. So to you who are trying to live for God, I must tell you, don't allow yourself to get weary with it all. Don't allow yourself to throw in the towel and say, well, I guess the good guys don't always win. Don't allow yourself to become so frustrated with all the trials of life that you begin to look around with negativism and pessimism and you begin to say, well, I don't know. What's the use? I might as well. There's no need trying to live for God. I have a message for somebody in this building. Don't give up. Don't give out. You can do this. God has got his hand upon you. Until you hear him say, well done, don't give up. Until you hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful. That means the guy that didn't give up. That means the person, the gal that said, well, I'm not feeling so good, but I refuse to give up. Until you hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, don't quit. Several years ago, A young man was hunting, and he was just a kid. I don't know why he did it, but he climbed a tree while he was hunting. Maybe he got bored. He had his little 22, and he climbed up in the tree. And if you've ever climbed trees, you know sometimes that you can put your foot, you can put weight on a a crotch in the tree or a Y in the tree, and it'll spread just enough to let your foot get in. And then it comes back. And it squeezes, and it hurts. And this boy was hunting, and he got up in this tree, and he had stepped into the Y of a tree. And I don't know why, but I know they found him dead. I know they found him hanging by his foot. I know they found a bullet hole in him because he felt like the pain was so great, and nobody was ever going to come. Nobody was ever going to help him. And in his childish way of thinking, he said, 
I can't take this pain anymore. And I'm talking to somebody in this building that the enemy would love to tell you, you can't handle it. You're not strong enough. You can't make it. You might as well give up. Well, I got news for you. God says you can make it. God says do not give up. God says, hold on. God says, I've got my hand upon you. Don't worry. Don't give up and don't give out until you hear him say, well done. Remember, whatever you're doing for God is for him. Would you listen to me just for a moment? Whatever you're doing for God, whatever you do for the church, whatever you do for your fellow man, remember who you're doing it for. You're doing it as unto the Lord. And, and if you're serving the Lord and you have a job where you're allowed to serve God, you ought to be saying, thank you, Jesus. What a privilege. What a privilege to be allowed to serve the Lord. Consider it, consider it an honor if you get to serve the Lord. And let me tell you why. A very, very great person said Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. What in the world? Do you get it? Jesus is saying, I assure you that no one has ever given up anything. Home, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, property. For the love of Jesus and for the privilege of serving him who won't be given back a hundred times over. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land, and there will be persecutions. We're almost home. You know, I, I don't know how to explain this to those who are uninvolved. I, I don't know how to explain it to you. But let me try. There is a level of joy that comes to those who are serving the Lord. There is a level of joy that comes to people who just do whatever they can for God. I can't explain it to you. But I can tell you that even when I'm on vacation, it's not very long before I'm going, they're having church right now. Mm, Lord, bless them in Jesus' name. There's just something about when you start serving God, there's an excitement that comes to your life like no other excitement. I appeal to everybody in this building to tell God, Lord, this year in 2014, I want to serve the Lord. It's such a joy and such a reward that nothing else brings. Well, <clears throat> the Ephesian church received several compliments from the Lord. He complimented them for their industry. He complimented them for their activities. And, and, and by the way, not just being busy, but busy for him. He recognized their toil and he recognized their troubles and patient endurance and, and how they would not, could not tolerate wickedness and had tested and critically appraised those who were going around calling themselves apostles. Folks, you've heard me say this before. If you hear somebody calling themselves an apostle, chances are, they are not. When somebody has to tell you what they are, they probably are not. So beware because as we get closer and closer to the coming of the Lord and, and there's more and more spiritual warfare, there will be spirits that will come along and, and they will say, this is of God. And they will say, 
the Lord is speaking to you. And, and that's why it's great to have a home church. It's where it's great to have a pastor. It's why it's great to have a Bible. It's why it's great to have a prayer life. Because as we get closer to the coming of the Lord, there will be more and more attempts of the enemy to get us off track. So, he complimented them how they had found those who were calling themselves apostles and yet were not, and exposed them for what they were. He applauded them for enduring patiently and bearing up for his namesake and not fainting or becoming exhausted or growing weary. I think that those are wonderful things to be complimented for. And I think that no matter what, followed those were genuine remarks and compliments but then 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 the lord cautioned them with these words nevertheless i have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love The answer to their problem was not to relinquish, was not to give up what they were doing. They were doing things for God, but, it, but somehow they had lost the reason why they were doing it. They were busy for God, but they had forgotten why they were busy. And they were doing things that God was complimenting them for. But then he said, but you know what? I, I have a, a problem, and, and my problem is, is that you've walked away from your first love. You don't remember why you're doing it anymore. You're just doing it because, well, you're supposed to. Their answer to their problem was to fall in love with Jesus all over again and to remember why they were doing the things that they did. The answer was not to give up what they were doing. The answer was not to burn out or burn up or relinquish. The answer was to fall upon their knees before God and say, God, I need to remember why I started coming to this church. I need to remember why I started this road. I need to remember why I'm living for God. I, I, I need to remember the real reason for it all. Name all the treasures this world can offer and none capital N-O-N-E, none can even come close to the treasure of having Jesus in my life. Oh, my, my voice is a little bit hoarse this morning, worse than ever. But there was a love song written several years ago that tells just a little bit of how I feel about living for Jesus. Pardon me, but it said, if ever I would leave you, it wouldn't be in summer. Seeing you in summer, I never would go. It goes on to say, but if I'd ever leave you, how could it be in autumn? How I'd leave in autumn, I never will know. And then he says, oh, no, not in springtime, summer, winter or fall. No, never could I leave you at all. And I know that might sound strange, but every time I've ever heard that song, I've always thought about the Lord. God, if ever I would leave you. And I, I've prayed in my prayer time, it, it, it wouldn't be in summer. And God, if I ever was going to leave you, it, it wouldn't be in autumn. I, I love the autumn, God, and autumn leaves. And, and Lord, if I ever would leave you, it's not going to be in winter, God, because I, I couldn't face a winter without you. And, and it might sound silly to you, but, but that song to me speaks about my desire to hold on to God, that somehow I'm never going to walk away from my relationship with him. When you realize you have lost something, you have to contemplate, where did you lose it? I drive my wife crazy with this. Because when you lose something, it's important to figure out just where you were when you lost it. It, it ruins my day when there's something I need and I can't find it. And it usually happens about, I'm, I'm going to be going to an appointment, I'm walking out the door. Oh, 
where is that thing I got to take with me? And I was going to be great on time, and now I'm running through the house looking under stacks, searching everything, going out to the truck, coming back to the, even running over to the church office, going up, checking my desk. I can't find it. Please don't ask me to look for that with you anymore. I may hear. I don't want to hear it anymore. And here I am, searching. Sweat is breaking out on my brow. And I'm looking for this much-needed thing. How many of you have ever lost your driver's license or lost your passport or lost something that was pretty significant, like a credit card? And all of a sudden, you weren't having fun anymore. And you ran out and you checked the truck. And you ran out and you checked the car. And you checked your purse. And you checked your pockets. And you checked your wallet. And you checked. And then you said, where was I at when I last used that credit card? Oh, yeah, I was at. And you think of the place. And you call. And they say, oh, yes, we have your card here. Because you remembered where you used it last, and that's how you found it. Tell me where you lost the company of Christ. And I will tell you the most likely faith place that you will find him. I want everybody looking up here right now. Tell me, where was it that you lost that first love? Where were you at when you lost it? I can most likely tell you where. You can get it back again. Did you lose Christ at the altar of prayer? Did something happen and your prayer life was interrupted? Then that's where you're going to find him. Go back to that altar. You're going to find him where you last saw him, where you last had him with you. You got to think about it. Where were you at? Was it in your prayer life? that has been interrupted for some reason? Did you lose Christ because of a sin? Was there something you began to do that caused Christ to be barred from your life? Did you push him out of your life because of some activity that you wanted or something that you preferred or something that you liked and you slowly begin to cool in your love for the Lord? Then... You'll find Christ no other way but by giving up the sin and seeking by the power of the Holy Ghost to mortify your flesh and make an effort to please him. Oh, did you lose him in the scriptures? Maybe you lost Christ by neglecting the scriptures. If so, you're going to have to go back to the scriptures. You're going to have to go back to your Bible reading to find him. There's an old saying, look for a thing where you dropped it. It is there. And some people are wandering around, don't know why that they don't feel God like they used to, wondering why they don't feel the presence of God like they used to. But the real truth is they've walked away from something, from God somewhere in their life, and the only way to get that experience back is to go back where you left him. You'll find he's still there. So look for Christ where you lost him. He's not gone away. You just got to go back to where you lost him, and there you'll find him. At first, it may seem like hard work. It may seem like really hard work to go back and put Christ at the center of your life again. It, it just may seem like, oh, man, it seems like a million miles to get back. Did you know that a person can lose Christ and not be an evil person. Sometimes people just get distracted. Just need to refocus. Just need to prioritize their lives around him. Matter of fact, would it make you uncomfortable if I told you that Everybody has lost Christ sometime in their life. 
to some degree, oh, Brother Stoops, oh, I've never. Well, I just want to give you a scripture, and then you can tell me if you think it's true or not. Isaiah 53 and verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. I ask you, is the scripture true? All have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way, and we have all done it to some degree. Does it mean that we were lost without God and on our way to hell necessarily? But it just means that at some points in our life, we can get distracted looking for that next tuft of grass and forget our mission and forget our walk with God and, and the joy and the love has just kind of ebbed down in our life and we're kind of just existing instead of living. I don't think any of us believe that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Joseph, Mary's husband, were evil. Do we? But when Jesus was 12, remember, he accompanied his parents to the Passover that they attended each year. And after the celebration, remember, they started home to Nazareth. But Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. And his parents didn't miss him for a whole day. They're not evil people. They just assumed he was with the extended family, friends, other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started to look for him among their relatives and, and their friends. And when they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. They were heart sick. I'm not going to go to the whole story, but remember, they searched for him for three days. They were doing not only physical searching, I promise you, they were doing soul searching also. They were deriding themselves and saying, what kind of a dad am I? What kind of a mom am I? How in the world could I allow my son to be missing? In, in the biggest celebration, the biggest crowd, the biggest general conference of Jerusalem, and I've let this kid get away from me, and God help me, he might, he might have been waylaid by robbers. He, he might be laying in a ditch, wounded and bleeding, and you can imagine the soul searching and, and the, the self-beating mentally of themselves as they worried and searched and scoured Jerusalem searching every conceivable place and finally after three sleepless days of soul searching physically searching three days of relentlessly tracing their steps they finally discovered him and they found him of all places in the temple I have never failed to find God in the temple. You go ahead and tell me about how you don't need to be in church regularly and you can find God on the golf course and you can be with God here and there. And there. You go ahead and tell me all that stuff. But I'm going to tell you that I know where I can certainly find him. I will always find him in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I will always find him in the temple. I'm going to find him in the church. Devil, you're not going to take my church away from me. You're not going to tell me that I can live for God and be a home Christian and I don't need church. You're a liar, devil. You're a wolf. And a wolf and a lamb fighting each other is not a fair fight. I need the flock. John Bunyan tells in his book, and I know I mentioned his book in one of my previous messages, but in that classic Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan mentioned that the pilgrim found the stretch of road back to the arbor of ease where he lost his role. He found going back that stretch of road the hardest he had ever traveled. Going back to where he had lost his role, he found that stretch of road going back to the arbor of ease. He found that to be the most difficult part of his journey. And I can quite easily understand that 20 miles going forward seems easier than retracing your steps backwards one mile when you're looking for that precious thing that somehow you have lost. 
Oh, you can be running through the day, but when you have to stop and try to reflect, where did I lose that credit card? Where did I lose that billfold? Where did I lose that cash? That's the hardest mile to, to try to find your way back to that place. I've had crazy things happen, like being out mowing the lawn and my cell phone fell out of my pocket. And you can see me walking across the yard, across the field. Where? I know that was in my pocket. It fell out. I hope the mower didn't hit it. And it's harder retracing your steps than it was the zillion times you went around the yard with the mower was a lot easier than the five or six times you're walking around trying to find what you lost. You know what I'm talking about. When you lose something that's really valuable, it ruins your day until you find it. And here's what you start saying. How did I lose this? What was I thinking of? Well, there was a guy in the Old Testament that went through something like that, and he said, Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Personally, I will not stop seeking until I find him again. You see, listen to me carefully. I'm almost done. Without Christ, I am like a sheep without a shepherd. I'm like a tree without roots. I'm like a leaf driven by the wind. I'm not connected to the tree of life. Without him, my life is in trouble. Without him, I, I can't live. How foolish of me. How could I have lost the most important thing in my life? How in the world? What was I doing? I must have been deceived. I, I must have been distracted. How was it that I lost that warm relationship with him? But I have a word for somebody in this building. Do not fear. For thus saith the Lord. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you shall call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Here's the problem. You have to want him back. You have to desire him back. You can't be satisfied just to be sitting in the church building among Christian people and know that one time you had a red hot walk with God, but it's not quite as hot and it's not quite as warm and it's not quite as real as it used to be, but at least, hey, I'm, I'm sitting in the building. You can't be satisfied with those kinds of thoughts. You've got to say, God, I want you back. I want everything you ever gave me. I want every experience you ever had for me. I want to know you, God. I want to feel your presence. I want to feel hot tears coursing down my cheeks again not tears of remorse but tears of anointing I want to feel the presence of God coursing down over me I have been living for God for many years and I know what it is to feel his presence and I know what it is not to feel his presence and with your whole heart seek him and he will be found of you give yourself though listen to thoroughly searching for him and to your great joy and your great gladness you shall discover him again and by the way when you find the master cling to him when you find him cling close to him cleave unto him for he is thy life and the length of thy days. The Lord is thy light and thy salvation. He is the way, the truth, and the life. When the sky is blue, when the sea is calm, it's easy to forget that without him, you can do nothing. See, 
The problem is when God gives us lots and lots and lots of good days and we're all healthy and our spouse is healthy and our children are healthy, we get lazy. And we get to thinking about this and that and the other thing and, and we start doing this number away from God, not even realizing it because, well, things are going so swell. Everything's going so well. Hey, this is easy. Anybody can do this. You're right. Anybody can do it when the sun is shining, when the skies are blue. But in all of our lives, hear me. This is what the Lord said to tell you. In all of our lives, there will be times when we will realize just how important and necessary having Christ close really is. Don't be deceived when the skies are blue and the sea is calm. Into walking, sidestepping, slipping away from the Lord and, and not allowing your walk with God to be up top. God is needed even when the skies are blue and the sea is calm. Bow your heads with me. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I need you, God. At 4 p.m., June the 14th, Jack was crawling down into a 10-foot deep trench that ran down the center of Washington Street, a main thoroughfare in West Roxbury, Massachusetts. It was near quitting time. Jack is a welder, and he wanted to finish one particular part of his job before he left. He said goodbye to the other men as they quit, took his welding lead in his hand, in his right hand, lowered himself and his electric power cable into the trench. His head was well below the surface of the street. Traffic above him was heavy. Though Jack could not see the cars and trucks, he could feel their vibrations. Occasionally, a pebble would break loose from the side of the trench and fall into it. It was Jack's job to weld the new water main, both inside and out. So he crawled into this 36-inch diameter pipe, inside a 36-inch diameter pipe. He lowered his mask to protect his eyes against the bright welding arc, then went to work. He completed the inside of the joint. He crawled out of the pipe. It was 4.30 now. He began to weld the outside. Halfway through the job, he stood up to get the kinks out of his legs. Jack stretched, turned toward the pipe, pulled down his shield again, and suddenly the bank caved in. Tons of dirt came crashing down on him from above and behind. Jack was rammed against the pipe with the force of a sledgehammer. He went down, buried in a kneeling position. His shield slammed against his pipe. His nose flattened against the inside of the shield. He felt his shoulder burning against the red-hot section of pipe he had just been welding. He tried to move it back from the pipe, but he couldn't. Then his head began to hurt. It was bleeding. He couldn't move. He was buried. Jack tried calling. He called three times, shouted. The sound of his voice died inside his shield. He tried to breathe slowly to preserve the, the supply of oxygen. And then it crossed his mind that he might die. Jack began to pray. Going to church, hit or miss, suddenly seemed quite inadequate. He continued to pray. He had his eyes open, but everything was black. Something cool crossed his right hand. He wiggled his fingers and found they moved freely. His right hand had not been buried. 
He moved his hand again. He tried to scratch around with his hand to open up an air passage down his arm, but the weight of the earth was too great. Then it occurred to him that he had been holding the welding lead in that hand. So he fished around with his fingers. He found the rod still in the holder. He grasped it tightly and moved it, hoping it would strike the pipe. Suddenly, his wrist jerked, and he knew he'd struck an arc. The electric current would be making a bright orange flash. So he kept hitting that pipe, making an arc, hoping to draw attention. Jack thought of all the hundreds of people passing within a few feet of him just above ground. He thought of his family, wondered if he'd ever see his little grandson again. He figured there wasn't anything to do but lie there and wait and keep tapping flashes and hoping that enough air would filter into the mass to keep him alive. There wasn't anything to do but lie there and pray. And his prayer was quite simple. God, send someone. In another part of Boston, on Route 128, Tommy Whitaker had quit work for the day. Tommy and Jack worked for the same company, were good friends. Tommy didn't know that Jack was on the Washington Street job that day. Tommy got in his truck, left his job at Route 128 with the full intention of driving directly home. He was going to take 128 all the way home, would be home in just a few moments. But as he drove, his friend was in peril below the ground and was calling out to God and saying, God, send someone. And as Tommy drove, he later would say, I began having a, a sensation that something wasn't right. He tried to shake the feeling off, he kept driving, but the strange, unexplainable sensation grew. He thought, maybe I ought to drive up to the Washington, Washington Street job. I don't know why, and just check it. But then he said, nah, that's crazy. He meant it would mean that he would drive six miles out of his way at the peak of rush hour. Tommy approached the intersection of Washington while on 128, and suddenly he just turned onto Washington Street, and Jack was praying, God, send someone. Tommy stopped his truck at a spot several blocks away from the cave-in and got out, chatted with an engineer for the Metropolitan District Commission for 15 minutes. He did not mention the sensation that he was feeling. Tommy got back into his truck, started up again. Sensation got stronger. He reached a stoplight. It was his turn off to get back to 128 by shortcut. If he stayed on Washington Street, he would have to go still further out of his way. He braked and turned on and kept on going up Washington Street underground. Jack finally gave up. He gave up striking the ark. It was making him breathe too hard. He didn't think he could last much longer. He couldn't get the blood out of his throat, and he was gagging. At that moment, up above on Washington Street, Tommy arrived at the spot where his friend was lying. Nothing seemed unusual at first. He noticed a company truck, didn't even know it was his friend who was driving it. Assumed another man from the shop was down in the trench. Tommy pulled up, got out of his truck, noticed the welder running. He thought someone must be inside the pipe, the 36-inch diameter pipe welding. Still didn't see anything unusual. Then Tommy saw the hand sticking out of the dirt, and he saw it move. Oh, God. Tommy jumped down to the trench, dug with his hands. The earth was too packed, scrambled out of the trench, shut off the welder, raced across the street to a garage. Underground, Jack, Jack heard the pop, pop of the welder stop. It was then that he began to prepare to die. He knew it was over. He was gagging and trying to throw off the mist that had come over him. Tommy shouted to the men in the garage, there's a man buried alive over there. Get a shovel. Tommy grabbed a shovel, ran back to the place where the hand stuck up, still not knowing it was his friend, uncovered the wristwatch, recognized it, kept digging, saw the man was breathing, and only then did, it real, did he realize that the buried man was his good friend, Jack. Jack's life was saved because God answered prayer and sent his best friend from across town to the rescue. And I am going to tell you something that God told me to tell somebody in this building. You listen to me. I take this seriously. In all of our lives, there will be times when we will realize just how important and necessary having Christ close really is.
You don't have to wait for a crisis. You don't have to wait till something is, somebody's life is hanging in the balance. You don't have to wait. He will fill you with his precious Holy Spirit right now. I, I'm not going to use the piano just yet, sister. He will fill you with his precious Holy Spirit right now. He will renew you. Somebody came to this building. God gave me this message before I came here. God spoke to my heart this message while I was in Florida on vacation. I began to write these things down last week, and I'm here this morning believing that the God who has everything under control and knows our lives and knows who will be here and who's not here told me to tell somebody, you need to get back what you've lost. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. I don't mean I want to go back to elementary stuff. I mean I want to go back to that red-hot relationship. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, where I first believed. Take me back. We'll let the choir help me this morning. I wonder. Is there anybody in this building that God's speaking to right now? That you want your relationship back with God that you have. That you don't want it to be in neutral. You don't want it to be backwards, but you want it to go forward. Is there anybody here right now? This is what God told me to say. Right now, the skies are blue. Right now, the sea is calm, but I'm telling you right now, there are times in all of our lives when we will understand how incredibly important it is. Turn that down a little bit, please. I wonder, is there anybody here?
Let's help one another right now. Let's pray for one another. Yes, Lord.